While I make every effort to broadcast correct information, I'm also still learning. I will double check all my facts, but realize that healthcare is a constantly changing science and art. One doctor or healthcare provider may have a different way of doing things from another. I welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. I take no money from supplement or device companies. By listening to this podcast or reading this blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice or to treat any medical condition, neither yourself or others including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your healthcare provider for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast or the website. Under no circumstances shall any guests or contributors to the podcast or blog or any employees, associates, or affiliates of the Boss Body podcast be responsible for damages arising from use of the podcast or the blog. This blog or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limiting to, limited to establishing the standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or the blog. What's up, guys? It's Dr. Tim Jackson with another episode of the Boss Body Podcast. Today, I have with me the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. <laughs> Nick Penault like the wine and he is the emf guy he is known throughout the world for his work on emfs and their effects on the human body he is the number one best-selling author of the non-tinfoil hat guide to emfs and an advocate for safe technologies through his unconventional approach blending humor science and common sense he's becoming a leading voice on the topic of electromagnetic pollution and how it affects our health for the last few years, Nick has been interviewing some of the best minds on health and technology and facilitating the creation of courses and educational materials to raise awareness on this very important issue. You can find more about Nick at the emfguide.com. Welcome, Nick. Thanks for having me, uh, Dr. Tim. It's an honor. Yeah, absolutely. So you and I kind of go back many years, you know, back and forth on email and collaborating on a few things. But for people who are just joining the podcast or getting into a wellness journey, what are EMFs and why are they dangerous? Sure. Well, that's <laughs> that's a short. I'll try the one minute version first. Okay, let's start there. Uh, so EMF stands for electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic frequencies, and it's an entire spectrum of frequencies that are found in nature, but also that are now emitted by modern technologies. And that's the, the entire point. Our, our bodies have evolved with being exposed to many EMFs that are naturally emitted by nature. For example, the earth has a natural magnetic field. Another example is the sun. We're exposed to a whole spectrum of EMFs. EMFs in the form of invisible and visible light. What, what happened in, and that made me study that topic of EMFs is not the natural EMFs, but is the, the process, the artificial EMFs that are emitted by modern technology. For example, your phone, uh, a tablet, a cell phone tower, a smart meter. And these are frequencies that are invisible. Most people don't feel them. You cannot hear them at least most people do not hear them so for most people it's a reality that is a little bit hidden from their senses uh, they use their gadgets every day they use wi-fi we're kind of exposed to all of this but they don't really consider that there could be health impacts and the the one link that has been in uh, let's say very controversial since the advent of the cell phone is using a cell phone on the head and maybe the fact that it's gonna cause brain cancer or increase your risks of developing brain cancer that's one of the risks and it's still a controversial risk in science some scientists say you know, it is definitely a carcinogen. You should not hold the phone to your head. Other scientists would say the data is not clear enough. But now there is data, a lot of scientific data that has been published on several types of harms, documented harms that you can have from a cell phone. And if these harms are true, we're also talking about Bluetooth devices, Wi-Fi routers, cell phone towers, and all the artificial EMFs that we've introduced in the last sometimes 10 years alone, but 
more so the last hundred years with the advent of electricity. Uh, one of them that is, I think now nowadays, especially in the last few months as we're recording this, has been uh, highlighted by very prestigious scientists such as Dr. Uh, Andrew uh, Uberman, who's from Stanford. He's a very known um, uh Science, scientists focused on the brain, but also an expert on hormones. And he stated that, you know, it is clear for him, the data is very clear that if you keep a phone in your pocket, which is again, something that half of men do in society, at least half, if not more, every day for the entire lifespan at this point, right? So that's something very common at levels of exposure that are considered safe by our regulatory agencies. He says that the data is very clear that this will harm your fertility and very clear that this will reduce your testosterone. As if we needed one more thing that harms our testosterone at this point, right? We know that it's like the processed foods, the modern stressors, uh, the endocrine disruptor, disruptors uh, in the form of like BPA and other plastics. Well, the, the, the kicker is your phone is also an endocrine disruptor. And, and if only if we stop there, it would be enough to change the way we use technology and to maybe change the safety limits for sure. But right now, what you can do listening to that would be to change your habits around technology. For example, not keep a phone in your pocket as much. Yeah, I, I just saw this at my gym the other day. Uh, a few people had pockets that you know are specifically de designed for their cell phones. And even a chair I have on my patio outside has a square for you to slide your phone into. So how do we mitigate this bombardment of non-native EMFs? And I want to kind of operationally define non-native EMFs because if I go outside and I'm barefoot and I walk on the grass, that's the Schumann resonance. That's a good EMF, correct? Yes, for sure. Exactly. The non-native stands for like, it's it's really synonymous with artificial. So the artificial EMFs in, in our environment, what is a little bit stressful when you think about it and you realize, oh my God, there's dangers to testosterone, fertility in men and women, by the way. So it's important to point out, it's not just about men, it's just that we have a little bit more data about men. But at this point, it, it's a bit daunting thinking about all the sources. You think, okay, well, really, can I really mitigate these dangers? Can I can I reduce my exposure? Because I see a cell phone tower over there. I look at my phone and see a hundred different Wi-Fi signals, right? So I'm being blasted by all of this. So what gives? Is it really useful to turn off my cell phone? And the reality is, yes, the dangers are exponentially higher when you have sources very close to your body. So that's an iPhone, whatever, whatever. I don't even know the version because I barely use it, right? The EMF guy, I try to not use my phone too much, but you won't see me with a phone in my pocket. In my pocket here near the heart, bad idea. In my pocket, you know, front pocket, back, back pocket. You choose where you want to expose yourself and have, let's say, damage or reduction of your human performance. I choose to just put it in front of me on the desk. Normally it's on airplane mode, but one thing you can do, you know, if it's in your pocket, it should be on airplane mode or turned off, or you carry it with distance from your body, a bag, you know, there's, there's different solutions, even certain cases by shield your body, for example, that's a good website, but there are certain solutions that you can use to kind of mitigate these dangers. And that's just from the phone, but there are, I think that you should start with devices that you have control over. <laughs> a lot of people, they get into EMFs, they get on forums or Facebook groups, and they say, oh my God, I'm exposed by a cell phone tower and this and that. And yes, there are also specific research around cell phone towers and how people who live closer to these towers uh, might have reduced levels of antioxidants or let's say an overall higher mortality rate and more symptoms from anything. So there's researchers who argue, you know, just living near a cell phone tower is a danger in itself. And that's daunting. And that's daunting to think about because most people do live within the vicinity of a cell phone tower these days in, in large cities. But you cannot turn off this cell phone tower right away. And you cannot necessarily move your entire family and business and life away from that tower either. 
So what you can do is mitigate the machines, the gadgets that you have control over. So one of the messages that I've been spreading for years is, well, okay, well, if that's your that's your low-hanging fruit on an EMF standpoint, how can you change your cell phone habits, your tablet habits, your how you handle your laptop, for example? So starting there is a great way to mitigate the risks, at least start mitigating the risk, right? Because there's always improvements to be made later, but without necessarily changing where you live, you just start ameliorating your environment. And part of it starts with the machine that you decide to put in your pocket or on your body, you know? Yeah, I read a stat a long time ago, I think eight to 10 years ago, that before cops had their um, radar guns mounted on the um, wind, not the windshield, but the dashboard, there, you know, they would have them in between their legs, and there was roughly a 600% increase in testicular cancer. I wasn't able to look it up and validate it, but I mean, even if it's a 100% increase, that's way too much. It, there's been, you know, various concerns in so many different types of um, of of jobs, right? Like occupational exposure has been studied heavily on a scientific standpoint because these people are even more exposed than the average person. For and a type of occupational exposure, by the way, could be my dad, who's a realtor. <laughs> in the scope of his job, he's always on the phone, right? So if you talk on the phone for two, three, four hours per day, or maybe eight if you're on Wall Street and you're literally glued to that phone. You have an occup occupational exposure too, but you might have an occupational exposure to uh, you know, to X-ray machines. And we know there's mitigation strategies for that. And that's a different type of, you know, that's an ionizing type of radiation. But still it it, it took it took these studies around operators of these X-ray machines or people who have them in their vicinity when they work in in medical offices, it took the identification of these risks until we decided, okay, well, when you do X type of scan, you got to wear that apron that is shielded, right, with lead. That's an example of mitigation strategies that have been um, implemented in today's society for a type of radiation. The problem with this cell phone radiation or this wireless is that it's not widely recognized as a hazard, which is step number one that we need to reach in the next, I don't know, I hope years, but I think it's decades until we can finally come to a, a better understanding and, and mitigate the risks. But the, the reality is that you can you don't initially have to shield against the these frequencies but just creating distance will dramatically reduce exposure that's kind of the good news right because yeah. even if you have occupational exposure let's say the, in, in let's say my dad again to take an example if he decides to use a wired headset just like regular headphones to his phone and hold the phone in his hand he's going to mitigate you know it's 95 percent of the radiation uh that is reduced and maybe he's going to hold it in his hand maybe it's you know a case a special case that can help not expose himself as much but i i'm not surprised that you know with police um, the police force, they have identified these risks. And the military also identified these risks. Uh, among the first uh, publications that you can still find on the internet to this day is the, the U.S. Navy in 1971, who had a massive report done by a scientist uh, called uh, Zori Glazer. And Dr. Glazer identified a set of 2,600 studies that were published in English, but also in the Eurasian countries, like uh, including Russia, including, I think, Germany and the, the Eastern Bloc at this point, who were enemies at this point in the, like in the middle of the Cold War or the beginning of. Uh, and basically what happened is, I think it's really, it's really a, a cultural thing that happened where our military kind of rejected these ideas that radar operators were overexposed because if they accepted the fact that their military personnel was overexposed, it would have put them at a disadvantage, basically, because the radar, uh, just to give people some context, is the same type of radiation as a cell phone tower, except at a 
pretty substantial power. These operators were working on live radars right next to them. And it was known among radar operators that um, you could sterilize yourself if you wanted to, you know, you, you the, these guys were Navy people. You went to a port and you wanted to meet women and have fun, you know, without any possibility of being a dad. You just w went on the radar for a few hours. That was kind of a, a a popular thing to to say, at least. I don't know how accurate it was as a contraceptive measure, but it just give, it gives you an idea that it was known. And then many scientists started studying the impact on military personnel of uh, a syndrome called microwave sickness. And that's really where it came from. And the reality is that all of this research, even though it's decades old and it's, it was on military personnel with radar, it still applies to at least our current understanding where it, it, makes, it makes you really wonder, well, if radar operators were very close to sources of this radiation and were getting sick or had fertility problem, how come this technology was allowed to be rolled out to the public? And that's a that's a trillion dollar question right there, or multiple Literally. trillions Literally. with an S, right? Yeah. So a big industry, you have reports from the 80s where um, researchers said, and these were scientists that's, that, that said, if we have more stringent safety guidelines for military personnel, it will hinder the commercial rollout of wireless technologies. It was before cell phones were ever rolled out. I, it, there's a few interesting quotes from that report. I think it's around 81 or something like that. Before it was you know, commercially viable to roll out cell phones, they knew that it would basically they would have to roll out cell phone towers that are very far away from people. It would it would have been a, a technological headache to try to roll this out. So the industry decided, you know what, we're going to do everything we can to deny these health effects and to have these EMF safety guidelines that, has, that are as permissive as possible. And these are the safety guidelines in Canada, the USA, Australia, and a few... And, maybe the UK, and you have other countries that are a little bit or way more stringent, but mostly the safety guidelines are not safe all around the world at the moment um, if if you really don't want health impacts from that technology. Right. Yeah, I tell people all the time, you know, whether it's a patient, a client, or a colleague, okay, let's say that I'm wrong. Then all you've done is become more present for your family, your friends, <laughs> yeah. your colleagues. If they're wrong, though, and non-native EMFs are unsafe, then there are a lot of repercussions, correct? Yes. Well, and, and that's, I think, I think that's the entire, right there is the entire point of why I do this. It, it, it frustrated me when I started my own uh, journey in health uh, and understanding you know, that we are exposed to certain things that in 50 years from now will be regarded as very dangerous. It frustrated me when I looked at the history of uh, leaded gasoline or asbestos or even smoking, which is a classic. When you look at the early warnings that were emitted by scientists around trans fats in, in the 1950s, and you realize that it took until the, you know, the, the 2010s for trans fats to be banned. And even to this day, there's still trace amounts because of the permissive guidelines and, and tricks that they do on the label. You realize, my God, this is a direct harm to the public that could have been could have been prevented if only we said, you know what? It looks like the research is showing something dangerous. Let's switch ingredients and let's, you know, I don't know, maybe let's subsidize this entire program as maybe the like the governments could have helped the food industry make that switch. It's that if that's too much hassle for them or too much of an investment where no, no, we cannot change how we do the manufacturing process. And even that is debatable, but it would have prevented, I think it's the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths directly from heart attacks related to trans fats. There are, there are good studies that look at the entire history of trans fats. And when I look at that, I'm just, I just become a bit sad, sad because I tell myself, okay, well, how can we 
do something smarter now because we have the science and we screwed up big time on many, many environmental toxins in the past. And it just looks like, you know, for a lot of agents such as electropollution, EMFs, it's just the same thing that is happening. And hopefully the cycle becomes a little bit shorter where we can identify the harms and then do something about it, start reducing the EMF levels, for example, uh, start minimizing or change how the cell phones behave. For all I know, you could have a cell phone with a proximity sensor, which they already have, right? Because it can detect if it's close to your body. And then if the proximity sensor says, oh, well, that's a new human being, it stops emitting radiation. How about that? Right. It's just a software update. It's like, I think they could implement that in two days or something. Thing. I don't know how difficult that is to do, but it would require, you know, making it either mandatory or the users demand it, which I think we're very far from that uh, from that market demand at the moment. But yes, these dangers are here right now, or at least that's that's what I argue. If you're not sure, there's not a lot of harm in reducing levels. It's a change right. of habits, and like you said, exactly. Some people that uh, start using these habits, oh, my phone is more on airplane mode, you know, most of the time. Well, I'm not distracted as I used to, and I'm not on social media as much. Most people feel healthier when they start having a relationship that is a prudent avoidance of technology, you know, or, or right. minimization, not initially avoidance, but most people don't regret, you know, they never go back. Like when they start realizing I was waiting, wasting all this time, maybe arguing on Twitter. I did that during the pandemic. Sorry, I, I'm, I must admit. But, you know, whether it's that or Instagram or watching memes and funny videos or it, it is it is a kind of a waste of time for a lot of people or most people have a hard time regulating themselves and having, you know, OK, I'm just going to take 20 minutes. They look, oh, no, an hour flew by. Oh, now I'm late on my work, you know? So it it is a big distraction. So that's another aspect to technology. And I think EMF awareness also comes with the awareness that we need to develop a more mindful approach to using tech gadgets. Um, and, and that's going to serve us well. It's going to make us healthier in the, in the short and long term. Absolutely. One thing I'm seeing, and I want to get your thoughts on, a lot of the wearable devices and biohacking gadgets you have to have an app on your phone open yep. and it's like a monthly subscription type thing. Do you see that as problematic? I see that as highly problematic. And, you know, something that is is to be determined. Um, I would argue that if you have a phone that might become a class one carcinogen. This is where the, the science is going. It is a class 2B carcinogen at the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, and that's since 2011. You have scientists, epidemiologists mainly, that look at the data that has come out in the last 12 years since that um, original decision, and they look at the same criteria of causality and whether it, you know, what new studies can be added to it, rat studies, epidemiology on humans, and many different levels of evidence. And they say, well, it is kind of already a class one carcinogen. And just to give you a context, this is next to smoking and asbestos. This is a huge deal. People fear asbestos. And in most societies, Maybe you still smoke, but you kind of know that it might kill you. And <laughs> I saw that package in Japan. You know, the, it was an ad for cigarettes where it's like, oh, smoke camel. And a big thing in English, smoking will kill you. I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, on the ad. So it was, uh, again, so that means the Japanese government said, okay, well, we're just going to put that on the packaging everywhere and sometimes with like, like hideous images of tumors of like oh, wow. pulmonary tumors and things like that in Quebec we have that in Canada so you know we're very far cell phones are not marketed that way imagine that imagine that it's a new Samsung 25 cell phones will kill you my god like how would that change consumer behavior right so it, it, it's just how it is so long story short let's take that research on cell phones and now let's say it's not a cell phone. Instead, I'm going to put a Bluetooth earpiece deeper into the brain. 
So the power levels will be smaller, arguably. Yeah, that's true. But the power levels are not the only determinant to that 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 make it dangerous or not. Proximity is important. It, it, yeah. So proximity will lead to an intensity of you know, how much is absorbed into the brain. And when you talk on a phone, if you have a smaller skull, I'm 5'4", so, you know, I'm not even the average model that they use for to look at how much the cell phone penetrates inside the skull. It was a six foot two man, which is nonsense because most people don't have that kind of head. But it would go almost through my brain if the if the phone is at a maximum. So some people argued with me <laughs> on the internet, engineers, oh no, it is, you know, it doesn't even penetrate. What are you talking about? It penetrates anything but certain types of metal, certain types of concrete, like heavy concrete, but it goes through wood, it goes through, you know, standard walls, it goes through most things these days, including the human body. Uh, some of it is absorbed at the surface, but a lot of it goes deeper and deeper. So I don't think it's a good idea to have an earpiece in. And some scientists, again, going back to Dr. Andrew Uberman, which um, I was very surprised to see that he started talking about EMS because he's someone that a lot of people look up to uh, when it comes to, you know, scientific, rigorous scientific reviews. And a lot of people in, the, in his community seem shocked uh, because he released that video, let's say, behind a paywall, um, because I think it's a bit of a controversial topic, but he's working on a on a longer episode. And he did say that, you know, one change that I did to my life is that I took my Bluetooth uh, earpieces and I, you know, I trashed them. Like I don't use them anymore. And it, it said something. He, he's someone from the mainstream, very, very credible. Academia. Academia and yeah. he reviewed the evidence and he said, I don't want that near my brain. I, I do not think that I'll regret passing them away right? right and and that's something very inconvenient because now it's now a lot of manufacturers are watching the podcast and saying uh oh we've just developed this you know it, it cost us two million to develop this biohacking tool but it's bluetooth only maybe we should have added an option to turn off the bluetooth but we didn't so now we're stuck with all these, these devices and what do we say to our community that we've just manufactured two million uh worth of devices that are dangerous or that are impairing your brain when you're trying to biohack your brain. So it's kind of, it, it's, it's, it's a very inconvenient situation for a lot of manufacturers. And um, some manufacturers understand these risks and they give at least options, such as the aura ring, for example, okay. uh, can be always put in airplane mode. And I still wear it and I just, you know, connect it to, to the little wireless charging base once per day open the Bluetooth that dumps the data to my phone and then I'm done. So it can be, let's say 99.99% free of EMF radiation of, of the wireless type. So that's good. Um, I have a brain tap system, for example, when you plug the wire in, it does tap the, the Bluetooth. Uh, so you have an, a wired option, which I like. Um, I really applaud them for that. So it was a really a conscious choice to add this wire in and to still... To this day, they're still manufacturing it, I think, with the wire. But most companies are ditching the wires. Even, you know, I tried to find these Bose uh, headphones that are the, the wired types, the QC35, or I don't even remember the, the code exactly. It They cannot be found. They all switched to Bluetooth recently. So Bose, for me, is it used to be my favorite company for, for these types of wired earbuds. And now I'm like, oh, I'm very frustrated with them. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, consumer demand will be high enough in the future to bring back the old, to bring back the wire because of those concerns. And I'm crossing fingers that it will be true. It will be a market for people concerned with EMF radiation, right? Oh, that's just because you're concerned. <laughs> I just purchased uh, external mouse and... It was really hard to find. I think there was like two of them in the entire store. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's like 80 um, mice to choose from, so to speak. And, you know, there's two ones with that you can actually physically plug in. The rest <laughs> employed Bluetooth. Yes. But uh, it, it worked out well because it was the cheapest one also. But uh, in terms of mitigating, so we talked about yes. you know, distance, the importance of distance, not having it on your body. Unplugging your router, Wi-Fi router at night, but and we get 
messages and ads for a lot of gadgets that claim X or claim Y. What ones do you feel comfortable recommending or what ones do you personally use for you and your family? Yeah, you know, if 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 someone, it really depends on how people are using technology. I don't use, for example, an EMF blocking case or something, a belt hoister that would shield me from the radiation, mostly because in the scope of my work, I'm um, an international traveler and no one calls me. So that, that's good for me. I don't have that distraction. But if you're in a situation where you need to not only keep your cell phone open, but you're always on the go. So maybe, you know, you're a realtor, someone in finance. Uh, there's so many situations where people have to carry a phone. There are solutions that I would recommend looking up on shieldyourbody.com where you can have it in a special bag that is shielded but you know, there's one side shielded that will sh that will protect your body, but the exterior is not shielded. So in other words, it will deflect the radiation away from your body, but still connect to the antenna. And that's the key. If you completely enclose your phone in a pouch that is blocking all signals, well, it's the equivalent of turning off your phone. So it's not really logical to to do that or most people wouldn't really be able to use their phone that way and you do not want in fact uh, a big problem with poorly conceived emf blocking cases is that if you block the antenna and make it more difficult for your phone to connect to a cell phone tower, you would in fact increase the radiation that your phone emits because naturally the software will ramp up the radiation to connect harder to the tower. So it will increase power levels. So unfortunately, in many cases, the, the, the random cheap Amazon cases that say, oh, it blocks all radiation, sometimes they are poorly conceived, they block the antenna, and they in fact expose you to more radiation, which is just nonsense. So I, I would avoid those. I'd say when it comes to talking on the phone, just make sure you have wired headsets. Some people are use the air tubes uh, kind of thing where there's no um, electricity going up to the head. I think these are a little bit more of a specialty product for people who feel electrosensitive or feel that they have symptoms very easily when they are around technology, which is not the case of everyone. But a lot of people who do not think they have these symptoms are surprised that they do when they eliminate the sources. Right, so, exactly. you know, it's it, it's it's kind of crazy. Um, when it comes to wearables, um, you know, I have a, a Garmin Instinct watch that I use for running. This one, the Bluetooth can be turned off. So I would say if you have a watch, if you have anything that has a Bluetooth capability, make sure it's still on warranty and test it. Unfortunately, you don't know how it behaves, so you kind of need an EMF meter, even if it's a very simple one, uh, to test how this machine behaves. Because if your watch is emitting EMFs 24-7, and you're not even using the Bluetooth necessarily, but if it keeps pulsing, it's just not logical to have it. And maybe you even wore it, wear it at night, and you're kind of on the pillow like this. It's mm -hmm. very close to your face. And you might have these needless exposures that don't even serve a purpose in your life. And, and that's the, mo mo the most frustrating part is uh, being aware of these dangers and not being aware that you're, you know, that, oh, no, my watch has been emitting for years. It's kind of right. a, very, a very sad thing to realize later. Um, as far as gadgets, I would say, you know, the gadget I use the most is an Ethernet cable. Um, even if you don't turn off the Wi-Fi, I would recommend grabbing an Ethernet cable because if if your router is in your living room, for example, and you're usually your favorite spot is the dining table nearby or your sofa, uh, why be on Wi-Fi, right? If you're on Wi-Fi in front of your computer, you are exposing yourself to the Wi-Fi antenna that is one to two feet from your laptop. Uh, that's bad enough. Some people put it on their lap, which is exposing very, very close to, you know, your, your groin area and those sensitive organs to something that we know will disrupt your testosterone. So you definitely do not want to have the laptop on your lap. It's just bad news. So to mitigate these things, you can turn off the Wi-Fi antenna in your computer and have an Ethernet cable instead go from the router to your computer. 
Once you're done with the computer, you just roll it up and you put it in a corner. It's a little bit more tedious because you have to wire your computer in and sometimes your your computer might not have the ethernet port so you need a converter between ethernet and USB C or whatever you happen to have but once you figured out these steps that are fairly quickly to realize it's pretty much plug and play so even if you decide to still have wi-fi in the apartment or the condo or your home you could wire it in and then for all these hours you're spending in front of your computer in some in the case of certain people, it's 50 hours per week or 100 hours per, uh, uh, per week that I used to do in front of a computer as a as a young author when I was burning candles by both ends. But I was I went on Wi-Fi. So it's, it's not only is this stressful being on a computer, uh, staring at a screen. There's many aspects of technology that are just unhealthy, being hunched over, you know, and then you add Wi-Fi on top of it and it's close to your brain and it's blasting you. And Trust me when I say a lot of people that I told to stop using Wi-Fi, use an internet cable instead, they feel that the main difference is not one symptom in particular. It's just that I don't feel as drained at the end of the day. That's big. That's a big thing. I have more energy. Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or cell phones, for a lot of people, they cannot really pinpoint how it's impacting them. But when you reduce exposure, it just feels like, okay, I feel like I have more energy. And that, that's pretty much it. It, it is a, a general invisible stressor. So yeah. the less, the more you lessen your exposure, the better off you are, regardless of your symptoms. And for a lot of people, they realize that during the day I stop having these exposures or I greatly reduce them, I feel more energy. And during the night, when I don't have my cell phone next to my nightstand, maybe I put it in some other room or I turn it off or I put it on airplane mode, I turn off the Wi-Fi. Now I have more energy in the morning because I sleep better also. So there are really benefits you can get from these changes throughout the day. Uh, but it, it, it really becomes something that compounds a compounding effect when you try to tackle those exposures where you're spending a lot of time in front of a device so whether it's uh i have i usually have my cell phone under my pillow for eight hours a night times 365 days and i stopped doing that so now boom you you've got like so many hours of exposure that you just eliminated whether it's that or i spend 10 hours per day in front of a computer and now i'm gonna stop using wi-fi most of the time because my laptop is 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 just uh stationary it's not even moving around uh in the case of my office in montreal it's in my office is in the corner of the of the bedroom it's not even moving i don't even know why i have a laptop at this point i should have a desktop computer in my laptop i bring it to a coffee shop but for a lot of people they're just on wi-fi because they don't know better like oh i don't know this is how you connect to the internet these days yeah but you know a few years ago we used to be a cable and it's still valid because now you can turn off the signal and you can greatly reduce the impact and the benefits if it's if it's not even energy levels i could argue it will be longevity because when yeah. you eliminate or reduce environmental toxins everything works better in your body decrease and inflammation oxidative stress ex exactly you know it, there there are good studies around antioxidant levels being lower across the board i'm talking about glutathione uh sod um uh, catalase for example that have been measured in human beings around cell towers and they are lower uh statistically significantly lower in those that are closer to those cell towers so you can see oh this is correlation not causation yes for sure but it is logical knowing the mechanisms around how emfs impact us which is oxidative stress leading to us overusing these resources to repair ourselves so if you don't have the stressors in the first place i mean it's just like removing that 20 pound backpack uh, you could have done with, but it's better without, you know? And I've read studies where, you know, they uh, took subjects, they had them eat a certain food in a high EMF environment and measured their blood glucose like an hour later. Then they waited a few days, same food, same subject, same time of day in a low EMF environment. And the people who were, when they ate the food in the high EMF environment, their blood sugar was significantly higher. 
Uh, you got to send me this one in particular, but there's, yeah, this is a link that, that I've heard. And I remember um, there was a prominent scientist, uh, Nora Volkow, PhD, who did uh, some studies where she found that cell phone radiation uh, increased blood sugar uh in the brain if i recall correctly and it was very very concerning i don't know exactly what happened with that researcher afterwards i think she probably much maybe she abandoned that line of research and it, it is something to 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 say that is very important for especially for people very scientifically minded listening to this is that when you study emfs it is kind of one of these untouchable topics where if you have good funding from the nih or whatever whatever if you study EMFs and find effects, generally speaking, the funding runs dry. So there's a lot of industry pressure to stop funding these scientists. It's been the case for decades. And now in the US, as we're speaking, there's barely if, um, I don't even know if there's $1 being invested in research towards EMF health effects. Most of the research that is coming out that is significant is from Israel, Spain, there's a few researchers uh, still in the U.S. and in the U.K., but they are, you know, they are self-funded by philanthropy, by the community, by peers. It it, it is maddening that we don't have like it is such a big topic. The implications are just impossible to fathom if we get this wrong, and yet the industry and governments alike, because they're kind of friends in. Yeah, right. in you know the 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 regulatory capture is just disgusting. Uh, I've been doing everything they can to stop studying these effects. So when you talk about blood glucose, that's another angle that needs to be elucidated. And what is bizarre to me and just it is just such a very weird state of affairs where we are right now because you have the medical community that some people are starting to realize there might be health effects, and then they might read, okay, well, does it mean that? It can impair, you know, proper blood glucose regulation for my patients that might be pre-diabetic or just for overall health. Like everyone wants, you know, a more stable blood sugar. That's kind of a buzzword these days. So what are the implications, though, if we start using a continuous blood glucose monitor that is in itself Bluetooth? Oh, my God. Well, I don't know what to tell you, but in sleep research is the same problem. I've been talking to one sleep researcher, told me, I uh, don't really believe EMFs can uh, impact sleep. All right. But the reality is I don't see studies done. <laughs> I don't see sleep studies where you have one lab that is shielded from exterior EMFs and that all the machines are wired in versus the super smart labs that they are building all across the top US universities and well-funded, millions and billions of dollars invested. Everything is Bluetooth. Everything is wireless for tracking purposes. So- I would love to see that study. I would love to see. And in fact, there are some sleep researchers that identified that EMFs can modify the sleep architecture, but they still argued in that article. I think it was published in Scientific American. They, they still managed to, I don't know how they did that, but it was kind of, uh, you know, um, how do they call it? Intellectual gymnastics, where you're like, oh, well, it does modify the sleep architecture, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. It's not dangerous. It's just, I got to find this article and send it over to see what you think. It was a little bit uh, too technical for me, but it does, like there is an effect, but we cannot conclude that it's dangerous. It's kind of what everyone is trying. There's a lot of denial going on. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, maybe the danger to sleep isn't great, but there are dangers to other aspects of our health. Don't get me wrong. So we do need more research, but we do need more research and it's not being done. It's mostly not being done. And that's the key. That's a very difficult uh, thing or state of affairs where we are right now is, okay, well, okay, because we have all this pressure not to study the topic that is so critical and we have early indications of danger, what do we do in the meantime? That was my entire thing. 2016, yeah. I wrote my book. 
I published it in 2017. And since then, I've just been saying the same damn thing on, on many podcasts. It's like, okay, well, what would, do we do right now? And now you have more and more scientists like Dr. Huberman, like you, that pe people on, in functional medicine, but also people have been contacted by people that are, are uh, teaching in dermatology, people who are teaching about bone health. Everyone wants to know, wait, wait a minute, if EMFs can impact certain processes that are very key, such as hormones or oxidative stress, does it mean that it could impact my patient, their bone health, or um, the hormones of a menopausal woman? So now many experts are trying to see the links in research, and a lot of them hit a wall and say, wait a minute, we need more research. <laughs> and then I tell them, yeah, we do. And um, Who's good luck it? with... Good luck with good luck with the funding because again there's I I think we're just yeah it's just it's just such a topic that is difficult to study first and then more difficult to fund and find okay and find people that would be okay with a result that is negative towards the industry that says no don't put your phone next to your hip if you're if you're an elder because it might contribute to you know you fracturing your hip imagine that headline uh, for a yeah. second and then you, you know two days later the researcher would get released of his position or her position you know, <laughs> maybe <that's>, you, <laughs> yeah. you know it happens all the time one thing i'd yeah. like to encourage people to think about is the guy i forget the doctor's name you know it was back in the early 1900s late 1800s who recommended that people sterilize their arms and hands before going into the operating room he was uh, had his medical license removed, revoked, and he was placed in a psychiatric hospital where he later died. Yeah. Now, if you don't sterilize, you're going to lose your license and probably <laughs> yeah. go to jail. So yeah. just something to consider. You know, I've, like a lot of my mentors say, you're going to learn a lot more from people who disagree with you. So at least hear them out and then, you know, arrive at your own conclusion. But like you said, you know, I have two uncles who were in Vietnam exposed to agent orange you know my dad was exposed to asbestos in the navy so we have a long history of you know the powers that be when there's a lot of money at stake you know not being exactly forthcoming on this topic yeah it's fun you mentioned agent orange uh the the one scientist maybe with a research team it was probably not alone working on this but the one scientist that is credited for having identified first that Agent Orange was a carcinogen is Professor Leonard Hardell from Sweden. He's a, a top tox toxicologist, epidemiologist, one of the top in the world. And he was uh, awarded, you know, many, many awards and really like a lot of accolades for his work around Agent Orange. Guess what he's been studying for more than 10 years? EMFs. Yeah, and now he's is shunned, you know, or it, it, it's, it's difficult to shun uh, one guy with that level of prestige, but now he's, he's just uh, published a few months ago, the first case study documented harm from 5G towers being installed on the roof of a building with two healthy human beings inside that had no health troubles with their health deteriorating very quickly after the, after the installation within a few months, if I recall correctly. So it's been uh, it's been published. I don't know how he does it, but he still has enough contact, you know, to be heard. But it it tells you that with with the five G towers, or it, it could have been a four G tower for for all that matter. But the five G tower are especially powerful. And these people were exposed to levels that were extremely high, very close to the top exposure permitted exposure level in Sweden, which is quite permissive in it itself. So it just shows you that uh, scientists that uh, have been at the forefront of other issues, such as or Agent Orange or even Magda Havis in Canada has been at the forefront of uh, the contamination of the environment by heavy metals, by different pollutants. She's now studying EMS almost full-time for, for all I know. So a lot of scientists that uh, realize, you know, that environmental toxins are a big problem for nature for humans and we we need to kind of get it right very early to stop the damage from happening to change regulations a lot of these scientists have you know went on to study emfs 
and are finding it very difficult. But I'm glad that a lot of them have the tenacity to keep on studying and publishing on a topic that is so, uh, I don't know, so difficult to find funding, to to be recognized as a scientist. Uh, it is still fairly ridiculed in the academia, but I think um, I think it will stop soon with Dr. Andrew Uberman and other scientists kind of making this a normal discussion. And even Uberman, something, and I'll, I I don't want to go on too uh, too long here, but no, I think this is I think this is key. On Twitter, he said. The you know I'm I'm publishing an uh, an episode on EMF soon. Um, uh, he said the you know the data is very clear on testosterone uh, reduction in men. The data is very clear on fertility issues. Why is this not more known? That's what he said on Twitter, <laughs> and I I laughed. You know I laughed out of it's almost like. Uh, out of desperation that I laugh yeah. because it's definitely not funny, but I, I was like, okay, well, Dr. Uberman, I don't know if you're listening to this podcast, but in the future, I hope to be able to connect with him because he's going to open a can of worms discovering that, oh my God, there's a lot of health effect, but there's a lot of reasons that captured regulators and the industry do not want these results to come out because it's going to be very bad for business or bad for PR. It's also the image of Apple, Samsung, Huawei. All the cell phone companies also do not want their product associated with something that lowers testosterone. Are you kidding me? It's at the moment, it's associated with fun, connectivity, apps, gaming, social media, cool, young, sexy people. So, you know, it's it's such a cool product, the smartphone. If I tell you, you put it in your pocket and it lowers your testosterone, uh, well, it looks bad. It's bad for business. So, yeah, it's going to open a whole can of worms. I think a lot of people in 2023 and beyond, I, I really start seeing a trend where a lot of scientists and medical doctors that used to think that this this entire topic is completely tinfoil hatter fantasy they're going to come around and they're going to have a big shock personally and it's going to shock their community equally but this is coming this is coming very soon i think because i really see um people that are more mainstream than usual coming out <laughs> doing their e their emf coming out in in a sense <laughs> It, it, it's unfortunate when there's you know big money behind these topics that oftentimes the study outcomes are predetermined in many cases. Yeah, and yeah. if it doesn't agree with your you know uh, predetermined outcome, it's kind of you know sw swept under the rug, so to speak. What's 100%. one thing that you know today that you wish you would have known ten years ago? Uh, you cannot save the world in a year. Yeah, that's that. For me, it's uh, it's been a big, big, big struggle finding my rhythm as an activist. Because in the end, sometimes I try not to be an activist. Like, oh no, I'm just publishing information. Still, I just come back to the fact that my real passion lies in changing things. I'm, I, I have to be a little bit angry, but not all the time which is a fine line, you know, you can, if you fight again Monsanto and you say, well, they're spraying all this stuff around and that's unacceptable and now it's Bayer, that's the enemy. And it, that's okay to think that, but there's also a life to live where you're going to be happy <laughs> or else you're right. going to sacrifice yourself, maybe for a cause that is a lost cause. I don't know if, it, you know, the, how how the EMF um, uh, talk is going to change uh in in the next decades and i think that my individual um level of satisfaction with my life was a little bit too attached to well this this has to change but it's going to take it, it is you know a uh, a boat that is quite hard to steer that's the entire societal reality where we are addicted to devices is going to have to slightly change towards like safer machines safer 
towers. It, it's going to take a long time. And I've come to accept that. But 10 years ago, I was, uh, I think I was very hungry with, you know, the, the, the youth energy. And when I, when I met you to work on my health, it was years and years after I literally burnt out and I had the adrenal hormones, including, you know, testosterone. And when I did, did my salivary uh, cortisol rhythm and whatnot, it was the equivalent of a 75 years old. I was 26. Yeah. So that's what you get when you are so scared of, of how toxic the world has become or how daunting a topic is that you're going to kill yourself trying to change it. That's unsustainable. Um, I, w I wish I would have known that to kind of skip a few years of uh, struggling with my health big time. And then if you struggle with your physical health, your mental health is also struggling. So just realizing that you're burning yourself out is a difficult thing to do when you're always brain fogged and things like that. So, um, you know, what changed for me is when we started working together, I had that in, in September, we started working together in January. And then in September, nine months later, I had my first few days in a row without brain fog. And I recall it very clearly. It, I used to be brain fogged all the time. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough to be there and to be reasonable and to be happy in that state. So don't burn yourself out. If you're an activist, that's fine. But balanced activism, I guess, is where, you know, uh, sustainable, it has to be sustainable, it has to be something you can sustain for the rest of your life, and you won't regret it. That's Just really like with detoxification, right? It's got to be same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much for being here. We know you're a super busy guy. Congrats on your recent summit. And thank you. We're going to post all the links to your social media and website. And hopefully we can have you back again next year. It sounds good. We'll be happy to. Thanks, Nick.